Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we learned about the Wampanoag before the so-called pilgrims show up in 1620, during that first faithful year, and a little bit afterward. And we saw how the leadership of the Wampanoag had to make diplomatic and strategic choices to give themselves and their people the best possible outcome given the incursion by the English. Their paramount chief, Osemaquin, or Osemaquin, skillfully used the presence of the English to his best advantage both internally and externally to take what had been a fledgling confederacy beset by enemies and turn everything around. And perhaps by 1624, he was more powerful than he had ever been before. Now for him, the English were a novel, useful group, very small in number. They didn't really know about the politics of the area that we now call Southern New England, and so they were somewhat clueless, somewhat naive, easy to manipulate, but extremely useful. I would say he navigated this relationship more successfully than Powhatan uh, down south with the colony of Jamestown. But the one thing he didn't calculate for, and none of the native groups did, was that the English, especially, were going to start coming over in numbers they couldn't imagine, especially after uh, a round of pandemics just devastated uh, the New England native tribes, 16, 16, 17, 18, 19. A single boat full of people uh, in Plymouth originally were not very threatening. And we today know that the English are, they're coming. They're going to keep coming. 1620 won't be the only landing, right? And so that's why today we turn to a settlement founded in 1622. This and the next couple episodes will be on the various English settlements that existed within the original grant for the Massachusetts Bay Company before it was given to the Massachusetts Bay Company. We tend to think of them landing in a howling wilderness and carving a living out of where the Native Americans once lived and died off. All of that is, of course, wrong. Where this episode is focused, there were already English people in the greater Boston area and within the Massachusetts Grant outside of Plymouth, which of course will be absorbed later, there was already English people there. And so let's see what they were up to. Let's see how they organized themselves. Who had rights over this area? What were the name of these colonies that you've never heard of? That's what we're going to talk about. This episode concerns a colony founded by Thomas Weston, who's actually a very important person to New England history, but maybe you've never heard of him. There's probably no reason why you would have. Weston had a lot of money and a lot of different businesses. The term used at the time would have been merchant adventurer, who was a bit, a bit like a, uh, a venture capitalist looking for investment opportunities. But sometimes these guys would actually get on boats and risk their lives in order to see through on these ventures. How Weston ends up having dealings with the New World actually has a lot to do with the Old World. So in the 1610s, he began importing illegal texts, mostly from the Netherlands, that had to deal with nonconformist religious ideas, ideas that would go against the official line of the Anglican Church, and even writings that were somewhat even extreme for the Puritans in England at the time. So these would be writings associated with the Separatists or the Brownists, uh, groups of English people who wanted a complete break from the Anglican Church, finding it far too infested with Catholic influences to ever be fixed or purified. And for dealing with less than legal texts, importing them into the country, he was also known for skirting around import duties. He wasn't paying the taxes he was supposed to. And for this reason and several other reasons, in 1619, he moves to the Netherlands along with a business partner. That business partner marries a separatist. And this is his connection to the Plymouth settlers. We tend to call them pilgrims. They were not called pilgrims at the time. They were called separatists because they wanted to separate completely from the Anglican Church, as I already mentioned, I'm already being redundant, or they were called Brownists, named after one of the prominent founders of this idea or movement. Many of these separatists had sought refuge in the Netherlands. One group centered around Leiden, and this group would actually be the one that uh, took the faithful trip on the Mayflower in 1620, along with a bunch of uh, people who were not separatists that they called strangers. And so Thomas Weston knew the pilgrims before they were pilgrims. That's the gist of it. Not only that, but he helped turn them into the pilgrims that we now know. These separatists in Leiden, they're finding their children to be a little too Dutch, a little too exposed to the culture. They didn't quite have the isolation they desired to make the perfect community. This will be a constant problem for Puritan communities and then the more extreme separatist community. They're on the same wing, so to speak. They're always trying to get pure. They're always trying to 
isolate themselves. They always want to get rid of the contaminants, all right, which is almost impossible to do anytime you have a political entity that has an environment that's you know larger than one little tiny village or hamlet. There's going to be people who get in. There's going to be people outside who you need to help keep everything inside functional. And if you don't believe that these groups of people had this obsession, uh, skip ahead to the Salem Witch Trials. These Calvinist movements at the time, they believed that the presence of the devil was right here, right upon you. You were locked in a cosmic war between good and evil. And at any instance or any sign of weakness, the devil would slip his influence into your community, into your mind, into your family. And so the separatists at Leiden, they wanted to start anew. They wanted someplace that the devil could not touch, a virgin soil. The reports were circulating of this, what King James called a great plague or divine plague. He used one or the other. I'm not going to look it up. Among the natives of what he called New England, first coined by John Smith. This seemed like divine providence. The land was being cleared for a new, perfect Christian community. And so while our future pilgrims had a lot of options, actually, they were considering settling within the bounds of what the Netherlands considered New Netherland on the Hudson. They had offers to go to different islands. They were expected to first sail to Jamestown and then sail up to the Hudson under the company of London. But as the story goes, they more or less accidentally ended up at Plymouth. I don't think it is, it is an accident. And I've brought this up in previous episodes. Mostly has to do with this guy, Thomas Weston. Thomas Weston was an investor in the Council for New England. And before the Plymouth settlers even landed, where they supposedly accidentally landed, Thomas Weston had already organized for them to receive the appropriate permissions and grants from the Council for New England. And so somehow Thomas Weston, before the settlers even landed accidentally, knew where they were going to land and knew from whom to get the rights. He was also the one to secure most of the financing for the Plymouth settlers. Thomas Weston also served as the treasurer for the Merchant Adventurers of London for a long while. He was a well-connected man, and it was his connections that gave these settlers the resources they needed to uh, import themselves to the New World. And so I contend they knew exactly where they were going. But this harmonious relationship between Thomas Weston and the Pilgrim Fathers was not to be. Thomas Weston was looking to make a return on his investment and all the people he roped in to investing into the Plymouth Colony. Meanwhile, the Plymouth Colony, those first couple years, were just focused on surviving, for one, and feeding themselves. The return on their investment did not seem forthcoming anytime soon. And part of the reason why Weston thought that Plymouth would ultimately be a financial failure is that it was seeded first with families. These weren't young working men looking to do a job make money for themselves and their bosses, and go back home. These were families looking to survive and live and grow. Now, by 1622, Weston saw a lot of opportunity in terms of the fur trade, especially in beaver, and the fisheries that could be had if only he could have a colony that was in or around the same location and more concerned about turning a profit rather than religious matters or family matters. All of these were distractions for him. So he actually obtains a grant from the Council for New England. I couldn't find a copy of it, and I've seen some sources saying that there's no existing copy. We just know that he did obtain a grant to make his own little colony, which again would be the very first within the bounds of the original Massachusetts Bay Charter, which would only come later. But now it would be time to recruit colonists for your colony. If you don't have a religious motivation to go risk your life at sea and start a new life in an unknown land, unknown to you anyway, what other motivation could you possibly have to make such a trip? Well, what if you're destitute? What if you don't have any other option? It's from this group that Weston is going to find someone willing to make such a risk. In his own words, he would call them rude fellows from the streets of London. Men with useful skills would rather stay put where they were or were already engaged in uh, the various fishing and fur trading operations coming down the coast. So he was left with simply people willing to make the trip. But additionally, there were a handful of his family members and close friends who invested in this proposed colony. They would also be coming over. Weston himself, as we'll see, was involved in a couple other activities and planned on eventually making his way there. But the leadership that would be sent over, initially anyway, would be Andrew Weston, brother of Thomas Weston, and Richard Green, brother-in-law to Thomas Weston. These relations aside, on board, there was also a man by the name of Thomas Weston. 
who never claimed specifically to have been part of Weston's colony. But his description of when and where he first came to New England matches up with Weston's uh, expeditions. More will become important later when he founds his own colony. And the last guy I want to bring up specifically is a guy by the name of Phineas Pratt, who 40 years plus after the events of this first colony, Weston's colony, will write down an account of what happened at Wessagusset and in other places, bearing eyewitness to the development of the English in New England. Now you might say, okay, well, Pratt's account, even though he was an eyewitness, came decades after the original events of this Wessagusset colony. Well, we also had the account from Plymouth of what was going on in this very close by colony. And the two accounts are rather harmonious with one another. So you have the outsider account from Plymouth, which was very close to when the events actually happened. But again, it's an outsider account. And then you have an insider account that was written down long after the fact. Seeing as how they flow so well together, that would, that would lend some credence to the fact that we probably have a reliable view of what happened in this colony. The Plymouth account claims that there was probably about three separate deliveries of men that would be uh, intended to settle at Wessagusset. Of course, they would port first at Plymouth. Now, it's important to note that the Pilgrim settlers were not expecting Thomas Weston's men to show up. Not only did they show up, but the account says that they showed up without really any sort of supplies. And so uh, what they did have was a letter from Weston asking the pilgrims to please feed his men and house them until they get their little colony started. The men at Plymouth did so. Uh, they were not happy about it, and they also didn't have to do it. Weston was somebody who they owed money to, who they had business with. But Weston wasn't their leader or boss or governor or in any sense of the word. The first 10 men arrived in May of 1622 on the Sparrow. And then between June and July, the rest of the men showed up for a total of about 60 men. And I say men because, again, no women, no children. It's noted that none of these men, at least initially, were among the separatists' uh, faith or inclined toward the uh, pilgrims who were known as separatists or brownists at the time, not pilgrims. And so by July, Plymouth is just inundated with more of what they would have called strangers, all looking for a handout, by the way. The one gift they did have for the Plymouth settlers was a confirmation of their patent from the Council of New England. In June, it was likely that Thomas Morton, one of the first men to show up, began doing a survey of the country. And it might have been him or him, along with the two men in leadership positions, that decided at the, that the site of Wessagusset would be where they would make Weston's colony. And by August of 1622, the full 60 or so men traveled north to set up Wessagusset, much to the relief of the people of Plymouth. But now you might be saying to yourself, where's Thomas Weston? What happened to that guy? Well, as it turns out, around the same time, so let's back up the clock a little bit to March of 1622, Weston was supposed to deliver a cannon that belonged to the Council for New England. I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, that it was headed for Plymouth. Now you would think, oh, well, he's going to take it and bring it to his own colony. No, he sells it to a Turkish pirate. That sounds like a good idea, right? But we already know the type of person Thomas Weston is. And I'm not exactly sure what his end plan was. When the cannon doesn't show up, obviously the Council for New England, uh, run at this time by Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, commander of the, of the Fort of Plymouth, England, is going to come looking for his cannon. So if the composition of this colony, the type of men who would settle it, hasn't already caused alarm bells to ring off in your head, this one does. The founder of the colony, the owner of the colony, is already in hot water. And this is just before even that first boat lands at Plymouth. Let's just put that on the back burner and let, that, let it simmer for a little bit. Because you know a reckoning is coming. Let's set off another alarm. Ready? So one group we haven't paid attention to, or a bunch of groups, are the Native Americans in the area. As soon, as soon as those West Augusta settlers leave, the men of Plymouth, they go to Usamequin or Osemequin. Say it however you want. And they say to him, listen, I know we just had all these settlers move in. They're going to go up. They're starting a colony at West Augusta near the Massachusetts tribe. We have nothing to do with them. I know they're English. But they are not our ally. They're not our friends. We're not conjoined in any way. They're, we're not part of a confederacy. Their actions do not reflect our thoughts at all. In other words, the Plymouth settlers write off Wessagusset to the natives immediately. Not that the Wessagusset men are going to do any better themselves. 
when they arrive at the site of their colony that they're about to build, they meet a native leader. He might have just been a war chief named Pexuit, or Pexuit, who is very gracious about having these English present. And he spoke in terms of friendship, and he was very giving and welcoming. But we'll set it up right now. You know this guy's going to turn. They also meet a chief, and I'm going to screw up this name, named Aberdecast. Chief Aberdecast. And this is the guy who gives him, the West Gusset settlers, some verbal permission to settle upon the land. Now, the Massachusetts tribe, as small as they were, if they really wanted to get rid of the West Gusset settlers right here, right now, before they had time to dig in, make any sort of structures, settle in any sense of the word, they could have done it. But no, they allowed them to settle at West Gusset. It's at this point in the narrative that Phineas Pratt, our eyewitness, says that the savages seem to be good friends with us while they feared us. Now, given even these shaky conditions, uh, they made quick work at making a colony that at least the leadership thought would be functional. By October of 1622, Andrew Weston, Thomas's brother and the supposed leader of West Gusset, he leaves for England, probably taking Thomas Morton with him. That leaves brother-in-law Richard Green as the sole leader. Now, at this point, how the, the colony was supposed to function is that there would be two ships. So it's, it's a very stripped down, profit driven idea. Two ships, a 30 ton boat called the Swan would remain in the colony, while the 100 ton boat called the Charity would carry products to and from England. Fur being the product that the men of West Augusta were supposed to establish decent relations with the natives with and trade for. And then fish, of course, uh, setting up their own operations, drying that out, sending it back to England to feed the, the hungry masses. Oh, but this was not to be, of course, Richard Green, the sole leader, once again, of West Augusta, October 1622, after Andrew leaves, drops dead. Now all the sources show that there was no chain of leadership after Richard Green. It was Thomas Weston, it was his brother, and then it was his brother-in-law. Morton might have been fourth, but he left too. And so leadership ended up in the hands of a guy by the name of John Saunders. And already by the beginning of November, Saunders is reaching out to Plymouth saying, hey, we don't have a lot of food. We're starting to get really hungry. How about we go on some sort of joint venture looking for or trading for food? Turning back to the natives, though, individuals at Wessagusset, acting on their own volition, their own stomach, were going about stealing corn from the natives. This is when our friend Peck Suet re-enters our story. He shows up at Wessagusset with a large group of warriors. And when the English came out to speak with him, Peck Suet said to them, Our sachem is angry with you. To which the English replied, Tell him if he be angry with us, then we be angry with him. Then Peck Suet said, Englishmen, when you came here into our country, we gave you gifts, and you gave us gifts. We bought and sold with you, and we were friends. And now, tell me, if I or any of my men have done you wrong. The English answered, First, tell us if we have done you any wrong. Peck Suet replied, Some of you steal our corn, and I have sent you word times without number, and yet our corn is stolen. I come to see what you will do. The English respond, It is one man which has done this. Your men have seen us whip him multiple times, beside other manner of punishments. And now here he is bound. We give him unto you to do with him what you please. This exchange is found, of course, in the account by Phineas Pratt. Pratt also records that Peck Suet was not happy with this arrangement, in that in his country, the custom is that the offending party be done away with by his own group, if that group is honestly allied with the party that was injured. And so under pressure from the natives, the English hung one of their own. Around the same time, some of these men were also participating again in a joint venture with some men from Plymouth to go up and down the coast and try to trade for some food. This is the same venture I mentioned in our last episode on the Wampanoag, where Tesquantum falls mysteriously ill and very shortly dies. At this same time, Edward Winslow of Plymouth goes to Usemaquin or Osmaquin and finds his entire village suffering from some sort of illness, a sickness. 
for which the great leader himself believes he's going to die. Winslow nurses everyone back to health. They start to see him as a medicine man of sorts. And as a reward, Osemaquin betrays the small Massachusetts tribe for which he was a longtime ally and reveals to Winslow that the Massachusetts tribe, because of the actions of the Wessagusset settlers, were planning a, a slow but building movement for a general uprising and a unified native attack against both English settlements. This was an interesting moment for both the Wampanoag and the English, because both went out of their way to reaffirm the alliance they had with one another that had weakened over the issue of Tisquantum. But with him dead, the Wampanoag betraying the Massachusetts tribe and Winslow healing the Wampanoag, the much celebrated alliance between the Plymouth settlers and the Wampanoag was back on. But this would be a tangent on our story of Wessagusset. Where they did get some food from this trading expedition wasn't nearly as successful as either settlement would have hoped. And very quickly with the onset of winter, both settlements depleted their food stores. Now I turn to a quote by Charles Francis Adams from the very famous political Adams family. Indeed, it is probable that the scarcity was greatest at Plymouth, but in that patient, frugal, and well-ordered community, everything was eked out to the utmost while at Wessagusset, little thought was bestowed on the morrow. Ooh, what a great quote, right? And so while the Plymouth settlers were able to successfully contain themselves and ration what food they did have, the people at Wessagusset quickly ate themselves out of house and home. And then they had to go about foraging, make some clumsy attempts at hunting, and of course fishing was an option. But the natives wouldn't trade with them, wouldn't provide them food, wouldn't even take their goods for food. And remember, these are men from the streets of London. They're not farm boys. They're not outdoorsmen. They're not frontiersmen in any sense of the word. And so their foraging was weak. Their hunting was non-existent. Their fishing, middling at best. Bradford in Plymouth uh, writes down a report he received from Wessagusset that one man searching for shellfish, already so weakened from the lack of food in the cold winter, became stuck in the mud along the seashore, and he sank down past his knees. Unable to get himself out, he simply froze to death right there in the mud. Can you imagine the horror of discovering such a scene? Can you imagine what it would feel like to die in such a manner? Between the executions and the conditions, 10 out of the 60 men would die over winter. In February of 1623, the de facto governor Sanders writes to Plymouth saying that the natives are unwilling to trade them food and that they are starving to death and that he is preparing to take food by force if necessary, planning to compensate them later. In response, the elders of Plymouth told him not to do this. This was not a wise thing to do. Much to their credit, the Plymouth settlers had learned something about the natives in the two and a half or so years they had been there. The people of Plymouth told the Wessagusset settlers that to do something like this would fly in the face of God's law and the king's law, warning them that Plymouth would abandon them to the natives. And if the natives didn't take any revenge, surely agents of the king eventually would, specifically agents for the Council for New England, the governing body back in England run by Sir Ferdinando Gorgias that gave any sort of legitimacy to Wessagusset or Plymouth in the English eyes. As consequence, many of the Wessagusset settlers began abandoning the settlement altogether, going to live among the Massachusetts tribe, working as servants, working for a whole day for a cup full of corn, being treated as the natives would treat their dogs, but eking out a survival nonetheless. In light of these conditions and feeling constrained by the Plymouth settlers, Governor Sanders decides to sail to Monhegan Island in order to trade for some corn to bring back to his colony. Plymouth gives him a small amount of corn for his journey, never to return. At this point, it's difficult to say who is in charge at Wessagusset. If push comes to shove, it appears that the natives are in charge, and the war chief Peck Suet in particular. Some sources say that Thomas Morton at this time became in charge of the colony, but it seems as if he had already left by that point. On March 10th, 1623, there's some sort of skirmish between the natives and Weston's men at Wessagusset, and several of the English are killed. Now it is at this point that some of the English who have been going back and forth between the two camps, let it be known to Phineas Pratt, 
that the Massachusetts tribe is ultimately planning on wiping out the English at Wessagusset and at Plymouth. Phineas, knowing that this was the time for action, although he by himself had very little he could do about the situation, knew he had to make a run for Plymouth. However, he told one too many people of his plan, and one of these in-between English people living between the native camp and the English site of Wessagusset informed the natives that Pratt was going to make a run for it. When the natives questioned Pratt, he said he had no intention of going anywhere and he didn't know what they were talking about. But the natives offered, hey, if you want to go to Plymouth, why don't we send a guide with you? Yeah, we'll help you get there because it's dangerous. It's late winter. It's going to be muddy out. You don't know where you're going. We can help you out. You can imagine both parties trying to read one another's intentions and the calculations of the mind that both would make in determining what to do next. What could you do next? What array of options were available to you? What Pratt ultimately decided to do was to spend time foraging around in a field nearby. Now, the Massachusetts tribe, this particular band anyway, had moved very close to the Wessagusset settlement over the winter. A move that the Wessagusset settlers took as threatening, like a mild, subtle siege of their settlement. And so Pratt went a bit of a distance from Wessagusset. Not enough to raise suspicion, just enough to show that he was scavenging for food, which had been what all the English were doing all winter anyway, all the while putting on the appearance that he was scavenging. And when he finally knew he was alone, and there were no eyes on him from any particular angle, at least in that moment, he made a run for it. Even on a modern map with modern roads, we're talking about a 30-mile hike to get to Plymouth through Massachusetts and Wampanoag territory. No trail markers, no paved sidewalks. And remember, Phineas is suffering from starvation like everyone else in Wessagusset. And the best plan he could come up with would be to race for his life a distance longer than a marathon. The Massachusetts tribe surely gave chase. And some historians have credited the fact that it appears that Phineas got a little off track, a little lost, which may have actually saved him because he ended up going places the Massachusetts tribe would never go looking for him, uh, knowing he was headed towards Plymouth. The ecstatic but exhausted Phineas Pratt even surprised himself when he showed up to tell the pilgrims of the impending attack at his settlement and their own. He was surprised to find out that the Plymouth settlers were not terribly shocked by this news. As we know, Edward Winslow, having returned from healing Osemaquin and his people, already informed Plymouth of the rumors of a general native uprising against the English along the coast. In fact, it appears Winslow had a more detailed and specific version of the rumor than Phineas Pratt did. But the two accounts put together pushed the pilgrim leaders to give Miles Standish, their non-separatist hired hand for defense, permission to do whatever he had to do to resolve the situation. Now, if that sounds ominous, it should be giving Miles Standish, a career military man, the open field to do whatever he pleases usually meant things ended quite violent. The settlers took this threat from the natives, this rumor, so seriously at this point. Because just the year before, in 1622, down in Virginia, the Powhatan people had organized a simultaneous slaughter of the English people, which greatly hindered the growth of Jamestown and, and its surrounding areas, obviously and would take many years to recover from. But the number of English killed in that one single attack on that one day was many times the population of Plymouth and Wessagusset combined. And so the threat was existential. And the English generally knew less about the landscape, the political landscape of the Americas than the natives did, certainly. So there was no way of knowing that the natives of southern New England didn't have some sort of contact with the Powhatan. Standish developed a plan with the native Habamak, a Wampanoag who kind of took the place of Tisquantum after Tisquantum died. The two of them gathered a force at Plymouth about them, and they traveled by shallop to Wessagusset, where they announced to the natives that they were planning on having a peace summit in the Wessagusset blockhouse. Providing food, Standish had everyone sit down for a meal. Meanwhile, one of the English would very quietly close the doors to the blockhouse. War Chief Peck Suet was there, also a sachem by the name of Wittawamet. Hanging around Peck Suet's neck was a large knight that he often taunted the settlers at Wessagusset with, 
telling him about how in the past he had killed English and French sailors with it, only after slowly torturing them or having tricked them in the first place. The English in the room were ordered to take cues from Standish, who walking behind Peck Suet, grabbed Peck Suet's own knife and drove it multiple times into Peck Suet's chest. He never stood a chance. The rest of the natives, it is recorded, fought bravely, but the element of surprise had won them over, and the English slaughtered everyone in the room. Habamak and Standish would then decapitate the war chief and the sachem to take his trophies back to Plymouth, a tradition both the natives and the English would have recognized. A brutal and successful surprise attack, it nonetheless spelled the end for Wessagusset, and all the remaining English settlers immediately fell under Standish's leadership. Riding on this victory the very next day, Standish organizes a force of the Wessagusset men along with his own and Habamak into Massachusetts territory to find a native village, only to run into the Massachusetts on the warpath, of course, headed right to Wessagusset. They exchanged fire and arrows, and to Habamak's credit, he surged ahead in front of the rest and scared away the entire warband. As if there already wasn't enough confusion, the chaos that ensued after this moment led to Standish retreating back to Plymouth. At one point, he takes a bunch of women of the Massachusetts tribe hostage, but rather than try to parlay for the English that were among the Massachusetts tribe, he left them to their own devices. They had thrown their lot in with the natives, and so the natives are going to decide their destiny. Meanwhile, he lets the native women go. It's likely that these uh, English among the natives were then tortured to death. It's known that three of the men following Standish were caught in an ambush, and the great sachem Abertacast tortured and killed those three. Standish managed to fight his way and flee his way back to Plymouth successfully with the Wessagusset refugees, whom Governor Bradford and the separatists in charge of Plymouth uh, found unfit to settle among them. At least for the most part, we know that Phineas Pratt eventually would. And so Bradford offers to send the bulk of them to Monhegan Island, off the coast of Maine, where they could find some fishermen and make their way back to England if they wish, or find work among these shadowy fishing colonies that were sprouting up. Pratt, who was too tired to participate in the Wessagusset attack, having run from Wessagusset to Plymouth, again would eventually become a settler of Plymouth. Of the ones who stayed in Maine, many of them starved to death the coming winter among the various operations up there. It's hard to track everyone down, but it seems as though as few as four of them are actually around over the next 10 years to make it into the records of colonial Maine. That being said, a lot of them probably returned to England, and some of them even ended up going to Virginia. And with that, Wessagusset is destroyed. It is over. The story is done. So why is this important? Well, even a couple dozen men sprinkled along the American coast several hundred years ago could mean hundreds of thousands or even millions of descendants today. It'd be impossible to know. Miles Standish would later be admonished for what he did at Wessagusset by the separatist leader still in Leiden, part of the Netherlands. And one of the colony's owner and organizer, the man responsible for the Plymouth settlement itself, Thomas Weston, who has so long been out of our story. Well, after the knowledge of him selling that cannon uh, was received back in England, all of the legitimate businesses, investment firms that had business with him or in which he held positions expunged themselves of Thomas Weston. He was deplatformed, delegitimized. A pariah, and worse yet, a wanted criminal. And so obviously the records get even more scant at this point. Weston either heard of the destruction of Wessagusset, or he was seeking some refuge there from his own problems. Either way, he had to disguise himself as a blacksmith and find work in the New World, with various operations off of Newfoundland and Maine. At some point, the vessel that he is on is shipwrecked, and he is rescued by natives, who then take him as a captive. He eventually escapes from them, and he ends up at one of these small operations that was sanctioned by the Council for New England and Sir Ferdinando Gorgias himself along the coast of Maine, who then gave him enough supplies to make his way to Plymouth. At least that's what he told the men there. Of course, he wanted to get to Wessagusset and see who was left, what was left, only to find a single blockhouse uninhabited, a very real visual reminder of all the bad choices he had made over the last couple of years. At this point, many men would fade from history or finally be caught and spend the rest of his days out in prison somewhere back in merry old England. But the American continent always had a special, soft, warm, and gooey place in its metaphorical heart for second chances. And for some, 
inexplicable reason, especially if you were a scallywag. Thomas Weston would somehow skirt authority and begin life anew in Virginia and eventually back in England. A more peaceful but quieter existence, a little out of the limelight, as he should be, despite all of his blunders and everything that happened at Wessagusset. Without Thomas Weston, the separatists from Leiden would not have been the core settlers who we now call the Pilgrims at Plymouth in 1620. This same group had many offers to settle in other places. Without Weston, they may have settled on the Hudson, under the authority of either the Virginia Company of London or, believe it or not, New Netherland. Take away Weston from history, and the butterfly effect is self-evident. That's it for our dark tale at Wessagusset. Please join us on our next episode when we're talking about, yes, you heard it, another colony at Wessagusset. Find us on YouTube and Faceplace and Twitter and everything else in between. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Yoss. Thank you for listening.